This is Amateur Logic, episode 90, for May 15th, 2016. This episode of Amateur Logic was brought to you by MFJ, the world leaders in ham radio accessories at mfjenterprises.com, and by ICOM. Pioneer your path. Any time is a good time for a new ICOM base station. Good evening. Welcome to another episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tommy. I'm Peter. And I'm Emil. Emil, you look like Peter. <laughs> I think I have to talk for a while. And I'm Emil. <laughs> talk to her. Oh, you sure are. <laughs> yeah. There you are. It's good to be back with you this evening. We've got uh, another fun show lined up. Tonight, just as a coincidence, because we did not coordinate this in advance. We usually don't. <laughs> <laughs> For the most part. <laughs> but uh, what I was going to say is, the title of tonight's show is, Everybody's Talking About Antennas. Yeah. Because that's... we're all talking about antennas. Yeah. Well, it's a good topic. Yeah. It is a yeah. good topic. Uh, by the way, anytime that uh, we're shooting live, at the same time, we're running a chat room over at AmateurLogic.tv slash chat. We're heading to Dayton next week. You got it, man. I'm ready. I'm, I'm excited. I'm ready, too. Uh, we've got a, a big, well, two big shows lined up yep. for this year. We're doing one Friday and Saturday. Yeah. What time are we? Yeah, uh, between 2 and 3 o'clock. Starting at 2, and it's probably going to run a little over an hour, but uh, yeah. Yeah, it's scheduled for 2 to 3. Yeah, two different Two different shows, so if you're there Friday or Saturday, you can drop by. Of course, we'll have uh, Rock and Ray coming in with us. Yeah, we got Rock yeah. and Ray. We got a, a pretty nice variety of guests this this year. We do. We've got a got a yeah a, a little different crowd. We got some yeah. of the people we had last year, but uh, yeah. a lot of different faces. Well, yeah, this a year. lot of new people. Yeah, uh, yeah. A few of them. I'm, well, actually, all of them. I'm really excited to chat with. So yeah, me too. It's gonna be fun. It is going to be a lot of fun, and uh, we appreciate ICOM hosting that again this uh, ab year. Absolutely. Now, it won't be streamed live because, um, well, Exceed is not providing the Internet service there this year, so we don't really have a, a good way to get video out of there. So we're going to record them just for you guys, and then we're going to bring them back. Yeah, so you will get to see it. You will get to see it. Well, let's But if you're there in the building, come join us. Yes. Because uh, there'll be mm -hmm. room for a live audience there, and uh, we'd like to see you uh, wear your Amateur Logic swag over there. So yeah. It'll stand out. Yep. I think I'll be wearing mine. I'll, I'm going to wear mine for sure. Well, let's get on into the emails for tonight. I've got one here that uh, comes from Bill Owens, AD5EW. And he says, Hi, George. I enjoy watching you on Amateur Logic and Ham Nation. I have a problem that I hadn't been able to solve to my satisfaction, and everyone I've asked so far has proposed uh, what I already know. You know, since I started making microphones with the uh, RJ45 connectors on it, he's had a problem with them breaking. So uh, he wants to know what you can do besides cutting off the end of it and splicing on a piece of cat5 cable to it he says the wires are too tiny to fit an rj45 and uh you know he he needs a solution for that well bill i've got the solution for you what you need to do is just get your wires prepared get another piece of insulation that's a little bit bigger around than the ones for your individual conductors slip it down over them then you should be able to put it up in that connector and, and crimp it down oh. So he's going to give that a shot. I, I've done that before, and 
it worked out okay. Yeah, those uh, those little plastic connectors, they're just not as robust as a good old metal one with no. the thumbscrew on them. I don't know why. Uh, I, I just kind of prefer those myself. I do too, but I mean, you only find them on HF rigs anymore. Yeah. Well, Tommy, what have you got over there? Yeah, I've got one from uh, John, KF4KI. He says, I've been a viewer for around three years and always watch the show, but in March, Mad oh, in the March Madness program, I particularly appreciate the segment on designing a for a 3D printer. You made it easy to understand, and now I know how easy it is, or how easy it will be to use this new technology, thanks to 73. And uh, yeah, it, it is pretty fun and easy. It uh, kind of seems intimidating at first, but once you just realize it's just a matter of putting the small pieces together to assemble whatever component you're trying to build and mm -hmm. take away pieces using the same same methodology, it's pretty easy. But uh, thanks for the email. I'm glad yeah. you liked it. Well, Tommy, I want to ask you anyway, what have you, you got for us tonight? Man, the ongoing saga of the fallen HF antenna. And squirrels were not involved no this squirrel, time? No squirrels were involved in this incident. <laughs> <laughs> I can't say that they won't be involved in the next one, but they uh -huh. weren't involved in this one. So I had a problem where when I, I had a homemade antenna mm -hmm. and I made a loop on the end and I put my dog bone insulators mm -hmm. on there and I, I used that basically that same lineman splice and I mm -hmm. soldered it together and eventually it just gave away right there at the solder. I don't know why, but it but it did. But So I went ahead and put up a new antenna. So I figured I'd drag everybody along for the ride. You know, I had a problem with that too on mine. I, I soldered them on the ends and I think it made it so stiff there that the flexing just made it break right off. Yeah. That's that's what happened to mine. It's, yeah, same thing here. Yeah. Well, my HF antenna came down again. This time I don't think it was the squirrels. I had some corrosion at the end of the wire where the little dog bones are put to, put on there and that's where it broke. So I think I'm going to take it down. I've got this MFJ 40 through 6 meter off center fed dipole. This is a MFJ 2012. And I'm going to put this up instead of the other one until I have time to rebuild it or build me a new one. Or, or I may just leave this up. The, the one I made covers 80 meters through 6. And this one is 40 through 6. And I really rarely ever get on 80. Um, I mostly just listen there sometimes. But uh, it's not my favorite band. So I think this one's going to serve me nice. It's a little shorter than the other one. So I have a little bit better room for it on my city lot here. So I'm going to put this up and we're going to put the antenna analyzer on it and check out where it's resonant and take a good look at it and uh, we'll just go from there. Looking forward to giving it a try. Okay, my weapons of choice to put it back up are I've got some good rope, hopefully squirrel proof, got some heavy duty fishing line, a heavy fishing weight, and a good wrist rocket slingshot well let's get started up to the roof i go first thing at hand is to take the old antenna down the longer end of my off center fed was still suspended from the tree in the backyard so i had to undo that because this is the antenna we used at field day i had a pretty good rat's nest of the copper wire so i had to untangle all that that took me about a half of an hour Now to wrap everything good with some rubber fusion tape. I usually put a couple of wraps around it and then put some electrical tape over the top. That makes sure no water can get in. Now I'm going to get out the fishing string, the weight, and the slingshot and get it over the limb. After not one, not two, but three times, it's time to break out the heavy artillery. I kept having problems with the fishing string dragging on the shingles by itself, so I needed some type of a spool to control it a little bit better. It took two tries with my old surf rod to get it over there. First one, it dragged a little bit coming off the spool. That rod and reel hadn't been used in years, but the second one, it sailed over perfect. The fishing weight I had was just a little bit light. It took me a long time to work it down through the limbs, but just keep tugging back and forth with the fishing line and eventually it'll work its way through. Well I got my son to tie the squirrel proof rope off to the fishing line 
and then I just pulled it back across using the rod and reel till it got to the antenna. I tied the black line off to the dog bone, and then he just pulled it on the other side by the tree until it hoisted the antenna in the air. We had already previously tied the other side to about the point where we wanted it. Always be safety conscious when you're working on antennas. Be careful for power lines. Use somebody to hold the ladder for you. And generally, there's a lot of things that could happen, so always be aware of your surroundings. As you can see, the old one was in pretty bad shape. The balance pretty weathered. The terminals are not too bad, but at the bottom where the antenna hooks up, it's got a lot of rust and corrosion. I'll either clean it up or replace it. Overall, the install is pretty successful. I think it's the highest one that I've been able to get it to yet. Well, the antenna's up. Coax is ran in here by my radios. I've got my MFJ225 antenna analyzer hooked up here, and I've got it set up to look at the SWR. And we're going to scan through and see where it's resonant. According to the documentation that came with the antenna, it's supposed to be good for 20, 40, 10, and 6 meters. So let's take a look and see what we've got. I've got our band plan up here that you can download off the internet. This one comes from the ARRL site. Okay, so, it's, uh, so it starts at uh, 6 meters, which will be 50 megahertz to 54 megahertz. So let's take a look and see where we are. The first band we'll check is 6 meters, and we'll work our way down. So I'm, up, I'm on about 54 megahertz right here. And according to this, the SWR is 2.8, which is below 3 to 1, which is still considered usable. I typically like mine a little less than that. So we'll scroll down to 50 megahertz, which was the lower, level, lower end of it. And it looks like we dropped down to 1.35 down there around, around the lower end, or actually around uh, 50.3. If we go to 50, as close as we're going to get, that's a 1.46 to 1. So that's totally usable. Next, let's go to 10 meters, which according to our trusty band plan here, I can never remember the, the exact frequencies because I don't use those very often. 10 meters is going to be 28 megahertz to 29.7. So we'll scroll down. As we scroll down, you can see that this uh, antenna analyzer gives us a nice graph all the way through. It looks like we've got a fairly low SWR at 35 megahertz right there, 1.5. It's about as close to 29.7 as I can get right there. So we've got a 2.4 to 1, and if we scroll on down at uh, 28.5, we've got a 1.1 which is considered perfect and if we go all the way down to the lower end of 10 which is 26 I'm sorry 28 if we go all the way down to the lower end which is 28 we've got an SWR of about 1.75 so that's uh, pretty pretty doggone good and totally usable across the band next band next stop 20 meters 20 meters is going to be 14 megahertz to 14.35. Of course, these are U.S. band plans that I'm looking at here. So we'll scroll on down to 14. And I see a dip in the SWR, so we've got to be getting close. 14.35 and then down to 14. Looks like this is going to be our best one so far. Okay, that's pretty close. 1.27 at uh, 14.369 and go down to 14 and that's going to be about 1.1 let's try it right there I, need, I probably should change the resolution a little bit more but it takes so long to scroll through 1.26 to 1 right at 14 megahertz so that entire band is, is totally good Next stop is 40 meters, 7 megahertz to 7.3. And it looks like we must be there. 7 megahertz, 
about right there 1.4 and let's go to 7.3 which is about right there and 1.7 so that's totally good let's see if just for instance it's uh, resonant down near 75 to 80 meters and it doesn't look like this antenna is going to be good for that checking it with the antenna analyzer it meets the specs for the documentation and they're the bands that I like to talk on so I've got it up I'm listening on it right now and I can hear great with it I'm looking forward to making some contacts on it 73 catch you next month so how did the antenna work out after all it worked out great a uh, little, little bit after I finished that I went in there and I, and I made some contacts down to Florida on the Florida QSO party mm -hmm. I, I'm real happy with it it fits on my lot better than the one I had I don't have to like put the ends over a tree limb mm -hmm. it's the only way I could get the other one in there and uh, I even tuned it up on uh, 75 meters. I haven't made any contacts on it, but I was the SWR tuned out of the radio. Of course, it's not resonant yeah. on there, but I mean, you could use it. Yep. Uh, Tommy, uh, which uh, which way is it erected? It wasn't clear because the video is a bit small for me, hard to tell. But is that erected vertically, horizontally, it's, inverted it, V? It's horizontal. Okay. I was going to a question, and uh, either of you may know the answer to this. With an antenna like that. Is there like a minimum distance of, uh, above the ground that you should put it? Because I have heard that if it's too close to the ground with a horizontally uh, polarized antenna, you can actually, uh, to quote unquote, smush your antenna and your signal will go straight up. If I remember right, it's a quarter, a quarter wave is ideal, right? At least a quarter wave? I think so. Yeah, I think it's a quarter wave. Mm. Um, but... Um, what you end up doing is however high you can shoot the line in the tree, right? That's the yeah. ideal location. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll be this time I actually shot it from the roof mm -hmm. and I was able to get it all the way over the tip of both of the it's over the tip of both the trees. I couldn't possibly get it not an inch higher in my lot there. Higher than squirrels can climb. No, not quite that high. <laughs> so I noticed you are you afraid of heights? I noticed while you were standing up on the roof there, nervous. you you were kind of kind of yeah. Shaking, you right? probably noticed my son looked kind of nervous too. I, had, yeah. I sped it up like a thousand percent because I was up there for a pretty good while. But my son has good reason to be nervous because yeah. <laughs> he helped me one time before, and I had him hold the the fishing line on the string I, instead of using the rod and reel. I was just going to use the spool, and I had him hold it up like that. And when I shot it. It went out and it came back and it popped him right there on the cheek. So he had a little bruise on his <laughs> cheek. I'm lucky. I'm real lucky it didn't hurt him any worse. Yeah. So I had him do it one other time after that and he put his motorcycle helmet on. <laughs> so I actually posted a video or a picture on Facebook of that one. Wow. But uh, anyway, it's working. It's up and it's working great. So. Cool. All right, we're going to be back in just a minute, but first this word from MFJ. For years, hams have relied on the world's most popular antenna analyzer, the MFJ259B. That compact battery-powered RF impedance analyzer combined four basic circuits, a 1.8 to 170 megahertz variable frequency oscillator, a frequency counter, a 50-ohm RF bridge, and an 8-bit microcontroller. Now the MFJ259 has been updated to the new MFJ259C. All the same great functions present in the 259B with an expanded frequency range. The MFJ259C covers all frequencies from 530 kHz to 230 MHz, allowing measurements all the way from the AM broadcast band through the 220 MHz amateur band. Make a wide variety of useful antenna impedance measurements, including coaxial cable loss and distance to an open or short. Primarily designed for analyzing 50-ohm antenna and transmission line systems, the MFJ259C also measures RF impedances between a few ohms and several hundred ohms. It also functions as a signal source and a frequency counter. The MFJ259C gives you a complete picture of your antenna's performance. Read antenna SWR and complex impedance, determine velocity factor, coaxial cable loss in dB, length of coax, and distance to a shorter open in feet. Read SWR. SWR, return loss, and reflection coefficient at any frequency simultaneously at a single glance. You can even read inductance and microhenries and capacitance and picofarads at RF frequencies. The large, easy-to-read two-line LC 
LCD screen and side-by-side -side meters clearly display all the information you need. While a lot of new antenna analyzers have appeared in the market recently, none give you the flexibility and wide assortment of RF measurement capabilities the MFJ259C does. If you've been putting off getting an antenna analyzer, then you need to take a look at the new MFJ259C. Visit MFJEnterprises.com today. And they, they've got a wide variety of antenna analyzers, but I think the 259C is probably still, you know, yeah, that's the that's popular. the workhorse. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's real popular. I like that one you use though. So. Yeah, that thing is pretty yeah. sweet, man. That is, but uh, great line of antenna analyzers there. Check them out. They got one for every need. Peter, what have you got in your email stack for us there tonight? I got uh, an email here from Eric, and he says uh, this was actually directed to your, yourselves. But hi, Tommy and George. I'm a product of the 80s and love the music. I was listening to the song uh, Land Down Under by Men at Work. I never quite understood all these lyrics until just now. That sounds like you guys and Peter. After all, sometimes he does talk uh, a different lingo. It's true. And he did give you guys some uh, bread and some Vegemite. Although Peter is far from uh, six foot tall, uh, full of muscles... On the inside, I am. Um, uh, uh, LOL. Keep up the good work, all of you. Even that man from uh, the land down under. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, thanks, Eric. Uh, and, um, yeah, that was a very famous song and uh, very popular overseas as well. A little um, addendum to that. Uh, you may not know that uh, there's a flute riff in that particular song. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, if you listen to it very carefully, it sounds a lot like the children's song Kookaburra sits in the old gum tree. And in fact, the license holder recently of Kookaburra sits the old gum tree recently sued the uh, writers of um, uh, uh, sued men at work about that song and actually won. And now a percentage of the royalties has to go to that license holder. So uh, when you listen to the song, just listen to that flute riff and you'll actually uh, hear that it is uh, the children's song. Yeah, we, we used to play that song out in the cotton fields, didn't we? <laughs> <laughs> the Kookle Barrel. What, Kookle Barrel, did you say? Kookle Barrel. Uh, Kookaburra. It's a uh, native Australian bird. Okay. With a, it, uh, and it also makes a sound that uh, sounds a lot like a laugh. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. well, that's interesting. I don't think I've heard that song. Really? Mm -hmm. The Minute no. Work song? The Kookle Barrel song. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a song that accurately describes what Australians are largely about. So go have a listen to the lyrics. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I remember the Men at Work song, and I, you know, not really speaking the language, it was a little difficult for me to, to interpret a lot of it. <laughs> well, uh, that Kookaburra song's been around a long time. I think I remember that from when I was a child. Yeah? Yeah. I'm probably just getting old. Out. Could be it. Yeah. Uh, the part in there, the Minute Work song, he just smiled and uh, gave me a Vegemite sandwich. I always thought he said he just smiled and took a bite of my sandwich because I didn't really know <laughs> about Vegemite. Man, you know? Oh, no, no. Definitely referring to Vegemite. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I'm a, now I wonder what he was smiling about. I do too, yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's, uh, let's see what Emil has got here. I know he's... He's got something from a related topic from last month. Yeah, um, I have an email here from uh, Dan Taylor, uh, K7SPR, Sierra Papa Romeo. And uh, Dan is writing about the uh, ubiquity um, antennas that we talked about um, last episode. He says, I just want to drop you a note to say that I've been using the ubiquity uh, CPEs for about seven years that you do not have to buy them in pairs like we were suggesting or multiple uh, to use them. So he, as the picture he shows there, um, there's an air grid 2.4 gig CPE configured in the station router mode. And I can say, George, that Dan is right about that. You, you put them in a certain mode and they act just like an antenna or a, a WAP. And uh, he, he says he pretty much uses them when he's traveling or, or you know, to hit hotels that might have remote uh, uh, wireless signals. So that is uh, that is correct. You can use them if you just buy one of them uh, for 
you know, picking up weak signals from very far away. Hmm. Kind of like a store-bought Cantana. Yeah. We need a pair of those for field day. Yeah? Yeah. If we could, if we could get a shot to my brother's house, but unfortunately it's... It's pretty thick in trees. We need a pair of them. We need one of them for uh, Dayton. Maybe we can yeah. scarf some Wi-Fi somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> we um. The, I know the reason we bought, uh, not bought. The reason I bought two of them is because I definitely wanted to do it in the bridge mode and remote linking. So that's why I had to pair. Okay. Yeah. Cool. That's pretty neat. Yeah, that is. Well, email. We we said we were talking all about antennas this time around. Yours is not really an antenna, is it? No, it's not an antenna, but uh, it definitely has to do with preparations for field day, and I think I've hit an all-new level of cheap. I, I think, <laughs> I, I would think you're right. Hello, George and Tommy. On this episode of Cheap Old Man Minute, I'm going to show you how to reutilize your pool noodles for portable operations. Just so happened to have picked me up one of uh, MFJ's extendable poles here that I plan on using for field day. And I had an issue with the top of the um, mast, the, the top mast being too thin to support some of my uh, uh, antennas with the U-rings being too large. So I went and grabbed one of the pool noodles that just so happened to have just the right inner diameter to fit over and voila we have a solution on another note you can see here i have my uh the lines this is a really convenient mast or raisable uh mast here from mfj uh that just allows literally one two hand operation with those stop marks there and literally I'm doing this as we speak with one hand and a camera tied behind my back. This will come in real handy for field day operations which I plan on using HF, VHF and uh, UHF operations and it's good 18 foot mast with the noodle way up there so I'll probably have another video just for this uh, on field day just to see how it uh, turned out support wise but just from my uh, brief period with it already it looks like it's pretty darn sturdy of uh it's gonna work good for field day looking forward to it and what a better cheap old man solution than a pool noodle I had to get a shot of the trees and the mast and of course the moon and just to show how easy it is to raise and lower the mast here I'll go ahead and get those clamps down Lower it down here. So far, so good. <laughs> of course, the noodle just as a demonstration. This is MFJ's, I believe it's 1919 EX uh, model. I believe it's about 160. Um, and again, for me, field day, throw it in the back of the truck with my uh, Yaesu Indoor ICOM rig, and I'm ready to go with the batteries and everything else that I'm going to hook on it. I'll probably also hook my uh, disc cone at the top, a wire somewhat, a little bit lower than that, and then the uh, dish, the 5 gig link dish to go back to the uh, clubs system. So again, that might be another video. So 73 is from KE5, QKR, and a cheap old man. 
Emil, I got to admit, the, the first time I watched that video there, I wasn't paying real good attention at the front of it because I was doing something else at the same time. You know how it is when you're multitasking. And it got down to the end, and I saw that pool noodle there sitting on top of that tripod, and I was thinking, well, how the heck is this supposed to work? You know, that's not an antenna, but... No, it's it's going to make up for my, uh, you know, the small mast at the top, so I can put the U-rings yeah. around it. It's going to, you know, squeeze onto the U-rings instead of the uh, little bitty, you know, finger-sized mast up there, fiberglass. Yeah. Now, now, you know, I'm not sure what's going to happen, uh, and this will be another field day episode, no doubt, but um, if you notice, the pool noodle was blue. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking that might help with the SWRs in if I'm uh, dealing with some light, you know, band antennas. Maybe red. I forget which one it is. Red is higher. Blue is. Uh, so maybe it'll help with the resonance there with the electromagnetic spectrum. I'm not sure yet, but I'll let y'all know. Okay. So do you have an assortment where you can actually do some field trials on that? I do. In fact, uh, the kids love, you know, they, they came in packs of like 10. There's red, mm -hmm. green, blue. So, yeah, I'll have to try it out. Yeah. I noticed uh, Mike VE3 MIC over there was asking, did you shoot that in a graveyard? <laughs> it was not. It was inside the uh, little back porch fence closed in areas that we keep the dogs out. And uh, you could see there that the uh, the two dogs were uh, enjoying that show pretty good. Mm -hmm. they're, they're but big it was fans not a burial plot. No. <laughs> they probably wanted that noodle to chase Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, they, they'll probably run if they see me holding that noodle because they know they're going to get whacked. Oh. <laughs> they're probably glad to see you doing something else with it then right yeah. right yeah wow. those, those tripods are pretty handy aren't they i've got one of those i use with my big ear i'm telling you what yeah. one two steps and it's up you know yeah. i mean you saw i had one hand with the camera and i just threw it up there so field day is going to be easy with that one this year and there's there's no thumb screws or anything on that one it just sets out goes real wide at the base and it's very stable so mm -hmm. i'll let y'all know how it works yeah. Is that the same one you've got? Uh, I think his might have one extra length though than mine. But it's basically the same. Yes, yeah, basically same the thing. same. Hmm. Uh, I've I've been taking some uh, some of that uh, trot line string and tying to mine and some tent stakes and guying it off because when I put that big ear antenna on the top of it, it, it gets a little bit top heavy. So anyway, yeah, cool. Yeah. Well, I've got an email from uh, who is this one from? Aaron Scott. K5ATG and Aaron says, hey George, while back I injured my back and had to spend the last eight weeks sitting around the house not doing much of anything. He said he tried watching television, but uh, that, that didn't last very long. So he passed the time watching Amateur Logic, Ham College, and Ham Nation. Uh, thanks to all of you guys for the hard work. It's very much appreciated. Well, Aaron, um, thanks. We're glad that we could could provide you a little entertainment during your downtime there. You know, Tommy, he mentioned Ham College there. Mm -hmm. and, well, he mentioned Ham Nation Amateur Logic too. But more and more, we're hearing from people who are who are watching Ham College and getting licensed. But a lot of people who who already got you know are even extras that are watching that program yeah it's a good resource to to review it and uh, seems like the words just really spreading about that thing we've been getting more and more emails about people that have uh, been encouraged by it you know mm -hmm. by watching it to to go and take that extra step and get their ticket and uh, that's kind of what it's all about right well that and you know i'm probably learning as much doing them as you know oh, oh, the, yeah. the guys studying for their tests because absolutely Good review. After after twenty something years, it's kind of easy to sort of forget a little bit of that stuff. Peter, have you got another one there for us? Well, I think you do, don't you? I do. It was uh, more actually a link. Uh, Raymond sent in a link to his web page, which has also got a uh, a picture, uh, and it's a picture of the original Pi drive. Uh, so, what's unique about this piece of hardware? It allows you to add an SSD drive. Uh, and it also has an 80 pin header, I think it's an 80 pin header, uh, so that you can put shields on top of it, which is uh, rather good. But I did note from um, the discussion on the page that the adapter uses USB 2.0. So, you know, uh, it's sort of, uh, 
uh, the, the extra speed that you would get out of that SSD is sort of crimped a bit by that USB 2.0. But there might be some specific uses that people might have for that. What have you got for us this time? I know it's got to be antenna related somehow. <laughs> it certainly is. <laughs> um, I um, This month's uh, segment, which is relatively short, is actually a bit of a cheap old man minute. I've taken a, a leaf out of Emile's book. And um, <laughs> for many of the people that are uh, just starting in um, amateur radio, um, they, they what's really handy is to have a manual that... Uh, uh, that allows you to build some simple antennas, particularly in your backyard. And a question that you get a lot is, well, what's the appropriate antenna for a backyard situation? Well, uh, I've found a uh, very cheap solution uh, to that problem. Hello and welcome once again. Today's segment is about antennas, and more importantly, a useful resource for antenna building. When you listen around the amateur bands, you hear a lot of discussion about the different types of antennas. One very common question you hear is, what's the best antenna for someone on a typical suburban block? Here in Australia, like many parts of the US, people live on houses or bungalows on a small patch of land, typically with a front and backyard. What's the best amateur radio antenna for this situation? Probably the correct answer to that question is the one that works. The type of antenna you use will vary according to the amount of space you have, any council restrictions on the erection of antennas, your budget, and of course, safety. Namely, not wanting to have transmitting antennas situated too close to living areas. That's something that our Australian Radio Regulatory Authority, the ACMA, is paying closer attention to. If a single piece of wire strung up on a tree enables you to hear and send to the person you want to communicate with, then that's perfectly fine. However, many amateurs want to maximise their antenna setup to be heard as far away as possible and also hear weaker stations. However, when you are first starting out as an amateur, there's a bewildering amount of information and misinformation out there so it's important to rely on trusted sources of information. One trusted source is the ARRL, who put out their ARRL handbook. There's a chapter in here that deals extensively with different types of antennas and the theory behind them. It's highly recommended, as is its sister publication, the ARRL Antenna Handbook. However, if you prefer a slightly less technical introduction to antennas and antenna theory in a practical setting, then here is a document that's free and quite reliable. It's US Army Field Manual 7.93, Long Range Surveillance Unit Operations. It's dated 3rd of October 1995 and it's in the public domain. The US Army puts out many, many field manuals, and it would not surprise me to find that they have a field manual on how to prepare field manuals. Field Manual 7.93 is, as you will see, quite useful and well written. I'm quite sure that both the Russians and Chinese have used this manual at some time. In case you think I'm joking about this, here's a screenshot of a Russian website with the manual translated into Russian. And no, I haven't photoshopped the web page. So what is Field Manual 7.93? It's a manual that discusses the long range surveillance detachment and its operations. And it's a really big manual. But we're only interested in one part of the manual, namely Appendix D. Appendix D very concisely covers high-frequency radio fundamentals, propagation, basic antenna theory, the concept of resonance, polarization, and discusses the following antennas and how to build them. The half-wave dipole, the inverted V, the long wire antenna, and the terminated sloping V antenna. By pure coincidence, most of those antennas are ideally suited to your backyard. It also covers repairing antennas, alternative materials to make antennas from, and site selection. It's very much a practical antenna building manual 
for situations where you're away from your normal QTH and need to throw a resonant antenna together and make it work. But it's equally useful for beginners. And the best thing is the manual is entirely free, which is just about as cheap as you can get. I'm sure Emil will approve. Check the manual out today at the link below. That's pretty doggone cheap right there. That was. That was. Yeah, I, I might have to look into some copyright infringement. <laughs> <laughs> good job, Pierre. Yeah, it's a, it, it is very good. I was surprised when I came across it. I thought, yeah, people could get some value out of this. So did you see anything in there that you wanted to build? Uh, funnily enough, you will have seen, not in the manual itself, but in the making of that, asset, that segment, you'll notice that I talked a little bit about misinformation. That made me think of the EH antenna, which I briefly um, mm -hmm. put up on the, uh, on the screen. That is something I want to build in the near future. Um, I've uh, at one time or another built most of the other antennas, log, log wires, etc. But uh, the EH antenna, I actually want to do at some point a comparison between that and a dipole and just see whether, in fact, um, uh, it works more efficiently than a dipole uh, mm -hmm. or whether, in fact, um, it's because of its very, very small size, it's actually very inefficient. Yeah. But until you actually go and try it, who, who knows? Yeah, I, I want to try one against a, a, a dummy load I've got over here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might have similar coverage, uh, according <laughs> to what, what some people are saying. Yeah. Really don't know, though. Mm. All right, interesting segment. Well, we've got more to go yet, and we'll be back. Pioneer your path. Any time is a good time for a new ICOM base station. Be one of the first to experience how ICOM is changing the way receivers are designed with ICOM's new IC7300. It will exceed expectations. It has RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, a large 4.3 inch color touchscreen, real time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. With ICOM's IC7851, when running with the big dogs, you'll be the leader of the pack with all the pile up breaking frequency running tools at your fingertips. 1.2 kHz optimum roofing filters, new local oscillator design with improved phase noise, several spectrum scope enhancements, and more. Other worthy candidates that cannot be overlooked, ICOM's IC7600 and IC7700. These radios feature LED backlighting on an ultra-wide 5.8-inch display, advanced DSP technology and three roofing filters, spectrum waterfall display on an impressive 7-inch color LCD, audio scope function for AF observation, and direct remote control operation with ICOM's RSBA1 software. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on ICOM's base station radios. Some nice looking rigs. There was some nice looking rigs, particularly that uh, 7700. There. Yeah, I like the 76 too. And the 7300 oh, well, that just came yeah, out. Yeah, I like them all. Very nice. Yeah, they're going to be showing the um, the 70, well they're going to be showing all their rigs, but particularly I think they're going to emphasize the 7300 some this year at Dayton. Yeah. There's been such such big interest in that. I'm surprised they're actually keeping up with production. I mean, there's yeah, you know, I, I expect them to get kind of backlogged. Yeah, but um, that's a that's a lot of radio for the price. Yeah, everybody I'm hearing from it that's got one is really liking it yep. so far. So it's a good deal there. Well, where are we going next? Well, everybody else has talked about their antennas. Well, you got a little something to say about yours? I got a little something to say about my antenna. Okay. I sure do. This is uh, this is a project I've been planning on doing for a little while. I've done it before, but uh, and I bought the stuff to do this. I don't know, a month or two back, and I've just just finally got around to it. And I thought I would share it. There might be somebody else here to get a cool. little use out of this. Today I'm going to build something that I built before, but it's been a lot of years, and I found myself in need of one again. It's a pretty simple little project that works really good. I'm going to call it the hula loop. Now, it's actually a shielded loop receiving antenna. It's very simple, very inexpensive to build. The ones I've made before, I built with a couple of pieces of wood made in a cross, and then I just did like a diamond pattern around it. This one, I'm going to use a cheap plastic hula hoop here I got at Walmart. 
Uh, this one's actually a little too big, so we'll be cutting it down. The parts count is real small. All you need is some three pair individually shielded audio cable like Belden 8777. I don't have any 8777, but I do have some 8723 Belden cable. It's got two individually shielded pairs in it. And I'll just take two seven foot lengths of this. I'll strip the jacket back. I'll take one pair from one of the seven foot lengths and wrap it with two from the other. Now normally you wouldn't need to strip the jacket off the cable but since I want to get all three pairs together that's what I'm going to do. don't really know that that's completely necessary but I want all my shields at the same potential. So I'll just carefully use a razor blade knife, make a slit through the cable and hopefully not my fingers. At seven feet this antenna should be resonant in the middle of the AM broadcast band. It's self resonant so you don't need to use a capacitor with it but Remember, this is only a receiving loop. I got the plans originally from some Motorola Sequam AM stereo documentation years ago. And it's published online now at this address. So I'll take my seven feet of cable here. I've got two pair right here. There is one pair that's red and black. The other pair is green and white. And there's also a drain wire connected in there, which you would probably think of as a shield next to the foil shield here and I'm going to take the other pair and I'm going to keep the drain wire with it and we're just going to wrap all these together. Now if we were using 8777 there would be three of these drain wires in here but we'll only have two that that won't really matter though. There you can see on the end I've got one red and black pair and then two green and white pairs and I've put a little mark on the end of one pair there so that I can distinguish them from the other. There's my two drain wires. Now what we need to do is feed all of this through our hula hoop or whatever kind of support you want to use. Seven feet of cable means that we're going to have a circumference of 84 inches. The diameter though should only be 26 and three quarter inches. The hoop I've got here is a bit more than that. We'll have to cut it down. So this hula hoop was spliced together with a little piece in the middle there to hold the two ends together. We'll just remove that for now. I've cut it down to 26 and 3 quarter inches in diameter. We'll feed the wire through it next. I've cut a little hole in the middle splicing piece here and now I'm going to try to put this together, pull these wires through that hole. And before I put the other end on, I'm going to slip a piece of heat shrink tubing over here. Well, at last I got them through. I'm going to glue this together using a little bit of my favorite here, 3M Super Weather Strip Adhesive. I've let the glue cure, and now we've got a nice tight bond there. I've stripped off the ends of all the cables, and I've got them in two groups there. I'm going to solder these together now. I've slipped a little heat shrink tubing back over them. I'll put my pairs together, then we'll seal it all up. We'll use this diagram right here for connecting them. You can see the red wire goes to the center of the RG59 coax. The other end of the red wire connects to one end of the black wire. And we just keep going around in a circle until we've gone through every conductor. The shields are only hooked up on one side and also connected to the shield of the coax is one end of the number two green wire. So here's what it looks like after I've got them all soldered together and heat shrinked up. Now I'm going to lay these down flat and just cover it with this big piece of heat shrink. Okay, let's give it a try and see how it worked out. Watch the signal strength meter here on the receiver as I turn the loop. So it does seem to be uh, fairly directional. We can turn it and completely null out the station. 
or we can peek it. So there you have it, the hula loop. No, you can't null out the dogs barking. So there's my hula loop. That's pretty cool. Now, did you go buy the hula hoop or did you take that from one of your daughters? And my daughters are, they, they've outgrown the, the hula hoops now, but no, I went to Walmart and bought that. Oh, okay. I would not have picked out a purple with the sparkly stuff around the middle, but that's the only one I could find that I knew would be big enough when I cut it down to work. Well, at least you won't lose it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and if you could get that to work on knowing out the dogs barking, we could use that here. I think we could, yeah. It'd be very handy. At the end of each month, it's Amateur Logic's Ham College, the new show for those new to the hobby and those wanting to get into amateur radio. Which of the following is a purpose of the amateur radio service as stated in the FCC rules and regulations? That inductor and capacitor form a tuned circuit. That's how you tune the radio to the frequency that you want. The English language. We lived in town. I liked it. I, I listened to mine a lot. It was really cool because you didn't have to have a battery to power yeah. them. There's our homemade telegraph station. We can use it for long distance communications. Oh, like, uh, what, three feet yeah, here? across the table. The answer is B. Voltage was named after Italian physicist Alessandro Volta. We can see we're generating a little bit of electricity there. It's DC. It's always great to go back and get a refresher. It sure is. A lot of that stuff, if you've been a ham for a while like we have, you, you don't really think about a lot of that stuff that often. They didn't have electric screwdrivers in those days, so that's why we're not using ones. That's why we went stress. primitive with it. Yeah. So let's see if we can hear anything when we, uh, we fire off our spark gap transmitter. Oh, yeah. Well, we didn't build anything or blow up anything today, but... Um, the night's still young. Oh, we've got a couple more emails, don't we? As a matter of fact, I think you've got one there. I do have one. I got one from uh, Josh, KM4KPN. He asks, will MacLogger DX run any ICOM rig? And uh, any is pretty broad statement, or pretty broad uh, category, so it won't run any, but... I did look at the website, and it runs the majority of the mo the modern ones. Um, so, uh, really? yeah, there, cool. there were quite a few that were supported. Cool. Uh, let's see. I think email has got either an email or a comment. Yeah, to give we us uh, we picked up uh, another um, comment off of Google Plus uh, from Mike Morneau, our buddy, and uh, he's he's looking into. Uh, Gigabit Ethernet uh, internet connectivity um, that's coming over uh, copper. So you know a lot of the technologies of uh, copper trying to compete with fiber before you know fiber speeds uh, get here. There's a an article in Wired I believe that he's referencing that where Comcast is actually going to start uh, providing gigabit internet to certain cities. Apparently there's a new uh, cable modem that's using the uh, DOCSIS 3.1 standard that'll uh, do it over copper. So we'll see. But basically, the push there is to get you know fiber speeds without the fiber, right? Because copper infrastructure is still everywhere. So they're gonna mm -hmm. kill it until it's not working anymore, or it's just rust. It melts <laughs> down. That's right. <laughs> so I mean, it's just a natural progression if you think about it. You know, in the data centers themselves today, they're running 10 gigs, 20 gigs, 40 gigs, and higher, and uh, that's both copper and, you know, fiber. So for that to come out to the houses to support all of this media like ALTV, mm -hmm. uh, that's where everybody's going to push for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I just upgraded mine today. I didn't get a gig. You did. You got pretty doggone good. Yeah, I'm getting like 160-something down mm -hmm. and uh, 24 up now. That's that's good. That's that's right. from Comcast. Yeah. You you had dial-up previously? Is that? I may as well have. I was getting like 12 to 16 down and uh, 5 up, and so I had a pretty big speed increase today. Yeah, not that 12 to 16 
is bad. I mean, there's a lot of people with DSL that, you know, that that have a less than that, a lot less than that. Yeah. But yeah, you're smoking now. Yeah, it's pretty fast. Yeah. Pretty happy with it. Yeah, I checked mine today, 111 down. Squirrel's going to get electrocuted when he bite into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I noticed you've got on a, a shirt there with Amateur Logic. This is not one of the, the no, ones that's available. This is, it, was a limited it's edition, not, wasn't it? And you know what? Uh, uh, one of the viewers mm -hmm. uh, made this shirt and sent it to me, and he sent the artwork, and I had a problem and lost my emails. Not email, emails. <laughs> and uh, I lost the file. I was going to put them out there on the uh, mm -hmm. thing. So I either need to try to recreate it, or if he's watching, if he wants to send it back to me, I'd be glad yeah. to put some shirts out there with well, it. It's a nice design. But the other one is a nice design, too. And uh, yeah. you can get those yourself. You can. You can get them at spreadshirt.amateurlogic.com. As a matter of fact, I posted a coupon code that's going on for the next week or so. Or you can get them at amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com. Is that not what I said? That's not what you said. Well, that's what I was thinking. I know. <laughs> I could see it right there above your head. <laughs> and I posted so, a coupon code for there, too. Oh, you did, but it'll probably be gone by the time anybody sees the episode. Probably so. But, but there, yeah, there's but, like, what, $5 off if you buy $30. $30. Right now. Yeah. But anyway, you know, we don't make anything off of these shirts. They're just, um, they're just there because people wanted shirts. Yeah, they were, yeah. A lot of people requested them, so yeah. we, we put them out there. Yep. That's where you can pick them up. If you got one and you're going to Dayton, though, be sure to wear it and, and fly the colors and represent. Yeah, wear it uh, when we're doing the, the show in the Icon booth. Uh, come by and, and show your support. Mm hmm. Oh, by the way, speaking of the ICOM booth, we've got a lot of people lined up. I'm not, I'm not going to read the list because I don't have it here. Okay, we probably shouldn't read it then. Probably shouldn't read it, but I will tell you that the troublemaker over here in the chat room, VE3MIC, will be joining us yeah. for a, uh, a special appearance there. He's bringing a whole load of photoshops that he's done. Oh, we're going to review some of the stuff that happened over on the Google Plus. Oh, yeah. Community. Those those things are great. Yeah. Uh-oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So uh, that that's going to be one one fine part of the uh, Yeah, looking forward to that. Program there. If you can join us, we're going to be recording live before a studio audience. We've got the crime scene tape ready to go here. <laughs> we'll be uh I'll be trying to carry this in the suitcase. Hope I can get through TSA with it. <laughs> they may need to use some of, the, some of it to tape off. They could. Yeah. They could. Anyway, this this stuff was pretty strong. It worked good for tying up Ray, but we he still broke loose and we couldn't keep yeah. the 7300. It worked, it worked good for uh, marking off our field day spot, too. Boy, it did. You know, that's coming up before you know it. Mm -hmm. Yep. And we've only got what... Um, about 2,000 feet left. That's all? That's about all, yeah. <laughs> Probably need to order some more. <laughs> Probably do. Those of you who are going to be at Dayton Hamvention, come by the ICOM booth when? Friday uh, at 2 o'clock and mm -hmm. or Saturday at 2 o'clock. Yep. And actually, we'll be there a little early setting up. Yep, yep. But uh, we'll be all over the place, so just watch for the two guys with the cameras. Yep. We hope to see you all there. And uh, if we don't, well... We're going to hit the record button while we're there and bring bring it back with us. Absolutely. 73, everybody. Yeah, 73. Oh, before you go, anything you want to... Yeah, we want to tell them where they can find... Uh... Oh, yeah, where can you find Amateur Logic? Well, you can download them from the web website, AmateurLogic.tv. We're on the Roku. We're mm -hmm. on iTunes. We're on YouTube. And we're also... A new place. The audio version of the show is on the uh, the new Google Play. The music app has a podcast section on mm -hmm. there. So uh, somebody had told us about it. So I got us registered over there. Doesn't support video yet, uh, apparently. But as soon as it does, we'll be on there for the video as well. Okay. But we do have quite a few people that just listen to the audio when they're driving and so forth. Yeah. So. Yeah. In a new place. Uh, Peter, any final comments from down under? Um, yeah, somebody, I just got a uh, 
uh, I think it was um, WA2IVD has just said, uh, Peter, just Google Snipe Hunt. So, uh, no, <laughs> go, don't, 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 don't Google, Google it. Show. Peter, it's better if you let somebody yeah. take you and explain it, it yeah. to you. The, the information that's on the internet is just not accurate. So, <laughs> yeah. can't believe everything you read. Yep. <laughs> no, it's well, true if it's on the internet. No, no. <laughs> unfortunately, in this case, it's not, Emil. Okay. <laughs> Any final words yep. from you? Uh, 73s, you guys have fun at uh, Ham Invention. All right. Hi, Cape. 73s, everyone. Yeah, 73, good night. And so I don't guess I need to ask everybody what have they got to talk about tonight. I guess you pretty well covered it. I'm kind of done on that one. Well, look at here. <laughs> <laughs> Email did make Emil, it. Emil, it was, it was really great to see you at Dayton last year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not w really what I intended, but... Uh, but it worked out well. It kind of worked, didn't it? Yeah, it's a good fit. There we <laughs> yeah. go. Yeah. What have you got in your email stack for us there tonight? Oh, uh, you're muted. <laughs> no worries, George. Lunchtime here in Australia. Are you going to have a Vegemite sandwich? No, I think I uh, might, might have some chicken soup, actually. Chicken soup. Oh, yeah, it's still cold down there, isn't it? You go pet your kookaburra. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry? You go pet your kookaburra. Uh, no, I don't, don't catch kookaburras. <laughs> they fly away anyway. So, But uh, no, but chicken soup would be nice. Yeah. It is cold. It's winter down here. I understand if you can sneak up close enough and put some salt on its tail, <laughs> you can catch it. <laughs> okay, just like a snipe, huh? You're just like a snipe, yeah. Wow.